guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. My name is April and I've been a nursing instructor for more than 10 years. Today we're going to talk about enteral nutrition and we're going to watch a little quick video clip on how to insert a nasogastric tube. Okay, let's get started. So with enteral nutrition, this is going to be prescribed by a healthcare provider when a client cannot consume adequate calories and nutrients orally, but the GI tract is functioning. And that's going to be really important. In a minute, we're going to talk about the difference between enteral and parenteral nutrition. And it's important to remember that for enteral nutrition to be prescribed, the GI tract does have to be at least partially functioning. Now we see enteral nutrition prescribed for burns, trauma, prolonged intubation and mechanical ventilation in eating disorders, clients who have decreased appetite due to radiation or chemotherapy, liver and renal dysfunction, infections, irritable bowel syndrome, and the list can just go on and on. We also see enteral nutrition prescribed for infants who are too weak to suck and swallow or or maybe they have an uncoordinated suck or swallow reflex. Maybe they don't have a gag reflex, or sometimes we just do it in premature infants to conserve energy. Now we are going to talk in just a few minutes about the commercial formulas that can be administered through the tube directly into the stomach or directly into the small intestine. Okay, so big difference between parenteral and enteral nutrition. In parenteral nutrition, our nutrition is going to be delivered intravenously because the GI tract is not functioning. Now, if you want to learn more about parenteral nutrition or you need a good refresher, I do have a video on my channel. I will link it in the card above and I will also link it in the description box below. However, today we are talking about enteral nutrition and this is going to require a functioning or at least partially functioning gastrointestinal tract. Now there are several ways that we can deliver enteral nutrition. The first is through nasoenteric tubes. So we can have a nasogastric tube, a nasoduodenal tube, or a nasojujenal tube. So these are always going to start in the nair and they are going to have the tip of the tube either in the stomach, in the duodenum, or in the jejunum. Now the jejunum is preferred if the client has high risk for gastric reflux because then we would also have a high risk of aspiration. But either three locations are acceptable for delivering enteral nutrition. Okay, let's watch a quick video on inserting a nasogastric tube. Perform a GI assessment, assessing need for nasogastric tube placement. Place patient in high Fowler's position and cover chest with towel or chunks. Explain the procedure and develop appropriate hand signal for patient using a pen light. Assess for any facial or nasal passage issues contraindicated for this procedure. If suction is ordered, verify suction source at this time. Connect suction tube to source of negative pressure, setting control per physician's order. Obtain the appropriate equipment for nasogastric tube placement. Measure from the tip of the nair to the earlobe using the NG tube. Then measure to the xiphoid process of the sternum. Mark the distance on the tube with a piece of tape or marker. Lubricate first four inches of the tube with water-soluble lubricant. Ask patient to slightly flex the neck backward. Insert tube into nair gently. Pull back tube slightly when patient starts to gag until gagging ceases. Ask patient to tip forehead forward. Give water with straw if applicable or have patient dry swallow if necessary. Advance the tube several inches at a time as the patient swallows. Advance the tube until the taped or marked point reaches the nair. Pull back tube immediately if there are signs of respiratory distress. Secure nasogastric tube in place. Do not let go of the tube until secured. Verify placement of the tube. Aspirate stomach content to test pH. <laughs> 
Collect gastric content. Test pH. Connect the distal end of the tube to suction, draining bag, or adapter after placement is verified per evidence-based guidelines. Dispose of soiled supplies. Ensure safe environment. Return bed to lowest height with brakes locked and appropriate side rails up and call light and bell in reach. Wash hands per CDC guidelines. Okay, there are other ways that we can deliver enteral nutrition directly into the stomach or the small intestine. And this is gonna be with a surgically created opening, so an ostomy, and then a tube can be placed into that surgically created opening. If that tube is going directly into the stomach, it is called a gastrostomy. If it's going directly into the small intestine, typically that will be the jejunum. It is called a jejunostomy. Now these ostomy or surgically created openings are going to be more for clients who need long term enteral feeding. So when we think about our nasally inserted tubes, those are going to be for clients who need temporary or short term enteral feeding. Okay, let's talk about the different types of formula. There are four types. There is polymeric, modular, elemental, and specialty formulas. Now our polymeric feedings, those are going to support one to two kilocalories per milliliter. And these are typically commercially prepared whole nutrient formulas. Now the GI tract does need to be able to absorb whole nutrient administration of of polymeric feedings. Now, sometimes these can also be created in the client's home or by our hospital dietary staff. These are milk-based blenderized foods and they can be prepared in a kitchen as well. However, in my experience, these are typically commercially prepared formulas that are administered to the client. Okay, modular feedings. These are gonna support 3.8 to four kilocalories per milliliter. And these are gonna contain a single macronutrient. So remember our macronutrients are carbohydrates proteins, and fats. These are only going to contain one of those, so therefore they are not nutritionally complete, and you will need to be adding other foods to the client's diet in order to meet a full nutritional diet. There are elemental formulas. These are going to support one to three kilocalories per milliliter. These are going to contain pre-digested nutrients, and these are going to be easier for a partially dysfunctional GI tract to absorb. These are higher in calorie, which means they have less water content. Therefore, you your client is going to need more free water at a specialty formulas. These are designed to meet the specific nutritional needs of clients that are undergoing certain acute or chronic disease processes. Now, when we think about how formulas are packaged, they can either be delivered to us in pre-filled bags, or they can be delivered in cans of formula. Now, if you're going to use a pre-filled bag, it will also come with administration tubing. And the only thing you will need to do is spike that bag, hang it and deliver your feeding. Cans will need to be open much like they usually have a pop top and much like a, a soda can. And then that formula will need to be dumped into a generic bag. Now, if you're going to take canned formula and put it into a generic bag for enteral feeding, then you can only put four hours worth of formula at a time into that bag. And that's to help prevent contamination, bacterial contamination and food poisoning. So let's say if your infusion is ordered to be at a hundred milliliters per hour, then you would only be able to put a maximum of 400 milliliters into that bag. And then you would need to store your unused formula in the refrigerator. And then you would add more as your bag got closer to being empty. You could add another four hours worth of formula. You can also use canned formula to deliver feedings directly into the tube using a syringe. And that would be a bolus feeding, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Okay. So there are four ways that we can deliver enteral feeding. Continuous and intermittent are by far the most common. Continuous infusions um, go on over, you know, an entire 24 hours. You use a consistent flow rate. You do then want to flush your tubing, and this is just with warm tap water, every four hours to make sure that your tube is patent and to help maintain that patency. It also helps to provide that free water and hydration to the client. Um, you can use anywhere between 20, 30, and 50 milliliters of warm tap water to 
to flush this tube every four hours. Now, intermittent tube feedings, these are going to be where formula is administered every four to six hours. And that formula amount will be anywhere between 250 and 400, maybe up to 500 milliliter portions. And those will typically run over 30 to 60 minutes. So again, you're going to use your feeding pump to deliver the, the formula, but it's going to be the smaller amount delivered over a shorter period of time. Cyclic feedings often happen um, when we're trying to wean a client off of formula or maybe even in the home environment. This is where feeding is going to only infuse over eight to 20 hours. And usually we see it like eight to 12 hours while the client is sleeping. That formula is being instilled into the GI tract. Bolus feedings are where we're using that syringe and we're just dumping that can of formula directly into that syringe and we're allowing formula to infuse via gravity into that tube. Um, now we have to be careful not to deliver this into the stomach. If you're going to do bolus feedings, it needs, they need to be delivered into the small intestine to prevent dumping syndrome. So not into the stomach, directly into the small intestine. Now there are a couple of things we need to consider before we administer enteral feeding as nurses. The first is that we want to make sure that that tube has been, the placement has been confirmed. We want to make sure we're in the GI tract and we are not sitting in the respiratory system or in the lungs. So the um, evidence-based way to do that is with a chest x-ray. That's the only verified evidence-based best practice way to confirm tube placement, especially after initial placement of the tube. Now for ongoing placement, as mentioned in the video, we can do gastric content testing of pH. So if you aspirate GI contents from your tube, if it's gastric contents, it will be a pH of five um, or slightly less. If it is in the small intestine, it will be a pH sitting somewhere around six. And if you are in the lungs, it will be pleural fluid and that will be a pH of seven or higher. So that's really what you're looking for on your pH scale. Now it is no longer considered best practice to inject air through the tube and auscultate for the bubble in the stomach. That is not effective for ongoing tube placement. We discourage it. You can use GI contents or chest x-ray. Chest x-ray being the gold standard and always done after initial placement. Now we should always verify the presence of bowel sounds before we instill formula. Okay, as we um, prepare again to administer this formula, we do want to administer formula only at room temperature. So if you've been storing, you um, already opened cans of formula in the refrigerator, you do want to make sure that you pull that out, set it on the counter and allow it to warm up to room temperature before you put it into your feeding bag and you get ready to administer that. Um, when you first start out with feedings, we do want to start out very, very slowly. So I like to think this is very similar to when we do blood administration, right? We always, for that first 15 minutes, start out at a much slower rate and then we work our way up to the prescribed infusion rate. Well, we're going to do the same thing with enteral feeding. We're going to start out very slow to make sure that the client can tolerate that feeding. And then we can slowly increase all the way up to our prescribed infusion rate. Now we do want to check gastric residuals every four to six hours if your client is on a continuous feeding and before any intermittent feedings if that is what is ordered as intermittent feeding. Uh, per facility policy, you'll usually give your gastric contents back. So after you've pulled back and aspirated for any residual, anything that you get, most facilities will have you go ahead and put that back into the stomach. Um, however, that could vary based on the facility. Now, if you get more than anywhere between 250 and 500 milliliters, and again, this is going to be facility dependent, but if you're starting to get that larger quantity of residual, Residual, um, especially on two consecutive measurements, then we do need to do some intervention. We need to decide or figure out why this enteral feeding formula is not being absorbed by the... Now, we always want to keep the head of the bed elevated at least 30 degrees during feedings, and we want to keep that head of the bed elevated for 30 to 60 minutes after an intermittent or a bolus feeding in order to reduce the risk of aspiration. So on a continuous feed, always elevated 30 degrees during an intermittent or a bolus 
elevate and then stay elevated for 30 to 60 minutes. Other things that the nurse will need to do, daily weights and INO. So we're constantly monitoring for fluid volume deficit, fluid volume overload, making sure that our fluid intake and output is balanced. We want to be continuously monitoring labs. So electrolytes, BUN, creatinine, CBC, monitoring our tube insertion site for infection. So if that's the nares or the nose, we want to be looking for skin breakdown. If that's the ostomy, we do want to be monitoring very closely for any signs of infection at that surgical site. We also want to monitor the character and frequency of bowel movement. So constipation and diarrhea tell us a lot about how well the body is absorbing and handling intral feeding. Now, remember, we do want to flush this tubing every four to six hours. We want to make sure that we're measuring gastric content, and we do want to be make sure, making sure that we're flushing before and after intermittent and bolus. Now, we can administer medications through a feeding tube as well. If you want to administer medications through your feeding tube, make sure that you stop the feeding first if you have a continuous feeding, and you want to flush with about 30 milliliters. Again, this is just warm tap water, and you want to flush before and after every medication that you give. Now, medications should be given one at a time, and ideally, they are liquid medications. Now, if you don't have a liquid medication available to you, you can crush medication, but again, we're only delivering one medication at a time, crushing one medication at a time. And then, of course, flushing before we start to give the meds, in between every med, and then after the last medication. Now, unfortunately, um, feeding tubes do become clogged. Um, it's just sort of the nature of using them to deliver formula, but also delivering medication through them. So we can try to unclog a tube with about 50 milliliters, again, of warm tap water, and we can use a 60 milliliter intral feeding syringe in order to do that. Now, there are commercial clot busters out on the market. That's what they're called. They're manufactured um, for the specific purpose of unclogging an intral feeding tube. Now, I do know that in facilities, um, sometimes they allow you to use a carbonated beverage to try to unclog the tube, although that is not considered best practice. So that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about using warm tap water and a 60 milliliter syringe or a commercially prepared product that is specifically for unclogging an intral feeding tube. We do want to make sure that we're providing meticulous oral care, especially if your client is taking in nothing orally. Now, sometimes clients are getting some degree of oral food and fluids in addition to intral feeding. We don't want to neglect the oral cavity. We want to be taking care of that oral cavity. Now, when we get ready to wean this client, we do want to make sure that the client is consuming at least two thirds of the protein and calorie needs um, daily caloric intake that they need before we completely discontinue the intral feeding. And that usually can take about three to five days. So we'll start the client very slowly on some oral fluids and some oral food while we're continuing to deliver intral feeding. And then as we get that client up to about that two third mark of what they need in their diet, then we can start to transition them off of the intral feeding. There are, of course, some complications of intral nutrition. The first is refeeding syndrome. So this is when the body goes from a state of starvation and we start to feed the body once again. In this case, it's with intral nutrition. We can see electrolyte and fluid shifts. We can also see um, altered glucose levels, and these can produce a potentially fatal reaction. So we do wanna monitor fluid and electrolytes very closely when a client has gone from nothing, so a state of starvation, to feeding. Food poisoning we've talked about. This is bacterial contamination of the formula. This is why we're going to replace the bag and the tubing every 24 hours. That's a good test question. So um, your feeding bag and your tubing can only hang for 24 hours before it then needs to be completely replaced with a new bag and new tubing. And then remember when we're using cans of formula to fill a generic feeding bag, that we can only put four hours worth of formula in the bag at a time. We also want to monitor for metabolic complications. We can certainly have problems with fluid volume overload, fluid volume deficit, hyperglycemia, and all kinds of electrolyte imbalances. We can also have GI complications, so constipation, diarrhea, 
abdominal pain, um, abdominal distension, nausea, vomiting. So if your client is having pain during administration of formula, nausea, vomiting, all you want to do is slow down that formula until that resolves. And then we can slowly try to increase that infusion rate again. If these symptoms continue, then we need to contact the healthcare provider. Of course, we also do want to be monitoring for constipation and diarrhea. Diarrhea is usually a result of delivering the enteral feeding at too rapid of a rate. And then we can also have mechanical complications. So our tube can become misplaced. It can migrate out. It can migrate too far. It can migrate over into the lungs. We can have leaking at the insertion site. We can have irritation of the mucous membranes. And then of course we can have a feeding tube that becomes clogged. All of these can result in our tube possibly needing to be removed and replaced. Okay, that is all the content that I have on enteral nutrition. Let's see what you remember. Let's check your understanding with some practice questions. Okay, first question. Now, remember, you can always pause the video if you need more time. A nurse is preparing to administer intermittent enteral feeding to a client, which is an appropriate nursing intervention, and this is a select all that apply. Okay, and so the answers to this question are going to be Discard feeding equipment after 24 hours. That's your bag and your tubing. Place any unused formula cans that are open in the refrigerator and flush your feeding tube every four hours. Let's look at the incorrect answers. So A, only four hours worth of formula. That is to prevent bacterial contamination. So not 24 hours from a can. Now your pre-filled bags, you don't have any control over how much formula is in those bags. But remember, those bags have been filled in a sterile procedure. So from the manufacturing company and they're sealed up. However, when we're using cans, of course we can have contamination from the top of the can, from our hands, from our technique dumping the formula into the bag. That's the reason that we can only do four hours worth of formula when we're dumping it from a can. And then of course, E, the head of the bed needs to stay up for at least 30 minutes after administration, but ideally it would stay up for as long as 60 minutes. And all of that would be to prevent aspiration. Okay, next question. A nurse is administering bolus enteral feedings to a client who has malnutrition, which is an appropriate nursing intervention. And this is also a select all that apply. Okay, the answers to this question are going to be verify the presence of bowel sounds, flush the feeding tube with warm water, and administer the feeding at room temperature. So this is a bolus feeding to a client who has malnutrition. So we always want to verify the presence of bowel sounds. We would never want to administer enteral feeding if we had absent bowel sounds, right? That would mean our GI tract is not functioning and we need at least a partially functioning GI tract to administer enteral feeding. We always flush our tube with warm tap water and we always administer our feedings at room temperature. Let's look at the incorrect answers. Elevate the head of the bed 20 degrees. Nope, always 30 degrees. And when we instill bolus feedings, those are feedings that are gonna instill rapidly. So anywhere between five and 30 minutes. If you were gonna instill the formula over 60 plus minutes, that would be an intermittent feeding. But a bolus feeding instills much, much quicker. Next question, a nurse is instructing a client on how to administer cyclic enteral feedings at home. Which information should the nurse include? And this is again, a select all that apply. Okay, answers to this question are going to be set the feeding up before you go to bed. So this is cyclic enteral feedings at home. So cyclic, remember, typically happens over eight to 12 hours at night while the client is sleeping. The next answer would be weigh yourself daily. Again, we're always monitoring for fluid volume deficit, fluid volume overload. Weight is the best way to look at acute fluid shifts. And those are going to be the only answers to this question. Let's look at the incorrect answer options. Give the feeding every six hours. So that would be intermittent feedings. This is cyclic feedings. Cyclic feedings are going to happen all night long while the client sleeps. Flush the tube with the carbonated beverage to dislodge clogs. So we talked about that. We do sometimes see that in hospitals and I do want to acknowledge that. However, it is not best practice. And again, this is a client at 
home. So if the client at home feels that their tube is clogged, they need to call their healthcare provider. And then E, ensure the head of bed is elevated at least 15 degrees. Nope, we've talked about that. It is 30 degrees. Last question. A nurse is teaching a client who started continuous feedings about the various types of enteral nutrition formulas. Which should the nurse include in the teaching? Okay, and so the best answer to this question is going to be standard formulas contain whole proteins. That is a true statement. These other statements are not true. So let's look at A. Formula that is rich in fiber is recommended when starting enteral nutrition. That is not true. We want to start with formulas that don't have any fiber in them so that we can see how well the client is going to tolerate enteral feeding. C. Hydrolyzed formula is recommended for a fully functioning GI tract. That's false. Remember the hydrolyzed or the elemental formulas are what we use for partially functioning GI tracts because they are partially digested proteins. D, the high calorie formula has increased water content. That's false. The higher calorie the formula, the lower the water content in the formula. Therefore, we will need to be supplementing with more free water. Okay, guys, hopefully you found this conversation about intral nutrition to be helpful. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave them below. You can also reach out to me via email. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, and I am posting daily over on those sites as well. Now, don't forget if you're struggling with parenteral nutrition versus intral nutrition, I will link a video in the description box below on parenteral nutrition. And just one last comment, I am running a sale in my Etsy shop right now. It is the spring break sale. Currently, you can get 50% off of every product in my Etsy shop. I have lots of case studies and study guides for all kinds of content, med surge, OB, and pediatrics. And that sale is running through March 31st, 2022. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video.